The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Welcome attendees. This is Sharon Stevenson. I'm delighted to have you join us today. This is an Empower ME program. Um, and in 2019, Solve ME launched their Empower ME education program in Washington. Driven by patient input, they strive to ensure that no family ever has to learn the hard way on their own. And that's really one of the main things we'll talk about today is sharing the knowledge of this uh, group of experts and helping you skip over some of the usual hurdles or be able to handle them uh, more efficiently. So this morning we're navigating public disability insurance with MECSF. We're also talking about uh, some of the issues around applying for disability insurance. So we want to empower you and your caregivers to make well-informed decisions about applying for disability insurance. Um, our panelists this morning include Dr. Lucinda Bateman, who graduated from Johns Hopkins and did her internal medicine residency at the University of Utah. She was a general internist in Salt Lake City for 10 years. And during that time, she recognized the need for advances in diagnosis and treatment of multi-symptom chronic illnesses, such as chronic fatigue syndrome, <clears throat> excuse me, and fibromyalgia. She left general practice and formed a con uh, fatigue consultation clinic in 2000 to learn more about these illnesses. And in 2015, she left private practice and formed the Bateman Horn Center, a 501c3 nonprofit organization with a mission to improve the lives of people with uh, fibromyalgia and MECSF through clinical care, education, and research. And I will just mention now, because it will come up again later, that the Horn Bateman Institute, um, Bateman Horn, excuse me, Center Institute is a, is a um, sponsor of the program today for which we are incredibly grateful. Uh, the, organ the way this is organized today is Dr. Bateman will go first and talk about sort of issues from diagnosis to applying for disability. And then Dr. Schnell, who I will introduce now, will be talking about what to do, how to approach things when your uh, application has been denied. And Dr. Schnell is PhD. He has over 25 years of experience in studying MACSF, particularly post-exertional fatigue and malaise that typifies the illness. He's part of a group that was among the first to advocate for the use of cardiopulmonary exercise testing to measure fatigue and therefore give objective criteria. Their two-day exercise protocol has the potential to be a biomarker for both pathology and function in MECSF. He's a former chair of the Chronic Fatigue Syndrome Advisory Committee, he's published extensively, and has done invited invitation, invited invitations, invited presentations for the National Institute of health. The third section of our program is legal barriers and challenges, and we're fortunate enough to have a really wonderful lawyer to talk about that, and that is Moselle Leland. Uh, she's an attorney with the law offices of Judith S. Leland, graduated magna cum laude from uh, UCLA, also my alma mater, I would add, with a bachelor's degree in psychology. She's completed her legal studies at Southwestern University School of Law in Los Angeles. She's passion for fighting for the disabled, which started at an early age from watching her mother help individuals obtain social security. She's admitted to the bar in California and has been in private practice since 2009, emphasizing social security disability law. So as I mentioned earlier, the kind of organization of the program, there's essentially in thirds, at the end, starting about two o'clock, will be questions and answers. And we have received in a, quite a lot of questions during the registration process, and we'll be focusing on those, but you can feel free to uh, offer questions and uh, comments. There's a control panel uh, tool through GoToMeeting that you should be seeing on your screens uh, that will allow you to, to ask questions. I'm trying to think, ah, and afterwards, afterwards there will be office hours it, to, for uh, the opportunity to ask additional questions and presumably receive answers, uh, which 
uh, we'll put that information on how to access that to you in uh, the chat panel on your screen. So all of that said, I believe we are ready to start with Dr. Bateman. And just so you don't get vertigo, um, the rest of us will disappear when someone's talking and then we'll reappear when it's, when it's our turn to talk. So Dr. Bateman, it is all yours. Thank you, Sharon. It's really great to be here. And I hope that um, the, the things that uh, we can tell you here will be helpful and make, make things better for you. Um, so I'm, I'm uh, going to present sort of the beginning of uh, this process. You're sick, you're unable to function, financially struggling, frightened and misunderstood and getting disability support can be a lifeline, but it is a challenge. Um, and one of the most important things for you to do is to help build a medical record um, that provides adequate information for disability adjudicators and your attorneys. It's not easy because of our rushed electronic and generally uninformed medical system. Next slide. So this is the challenge, this is probably one of the biggest challenging things right now is to find a doctor who can um, be on your team and advocate for you. So what I would, I'm going to give you some hints um, and maybe you can keep track of them. Um, I also know that this is difficult, but one of the part of our mission at Bateman Horn Center is to um, educate physicians. And so um, I am hopeful, and we've been working with more and more physicians, that we will be able to educate the general medical community so they can be better advocates for you. Um, in the meantime, um, you should be sure from uh, early on in your illness that you have at least one physician, uh, usually a primary care provider, who follows your illness and is aware of everything, sort of the captain of the ship and the coordinator. You should be sure and see that doctor at regular intervals. Um, and, and be proactive at getting appointments set up. I usually see my patients at least every three months until their disability has been approved so that I can create a, a medical record to support them. And um, do your best to educate your primary care provider about MECFS and engage them in the management. So um, I really uh, think that part of educating physicians is for you to take, take uh, MECFS to them and let them learn about this illness from managing you. Um, I do want to say that there is a US MECFS clinician coalition uh, that's growing. We just met over the weekend about 40 uh, different uh, interested uh, physicians and scientists about how to uh, improve materials available for physicians about the disease and about managing it. Um, but there is also a one pager, or, or maybe it's two or three pages out there, um, a consensus document from the MECFS uh, Clinician Coalition that was made in August. It's called Diagnosing and Treating MECFS. And at the very minimum, you should print this off and take it to your medical providers to help educate them about the illness so they can uh, partner with you in, in making a good medical record. We're also developing a website with medical resources for doctors. And hopefully within a month or so, um, that's someplace you can uh, send your doctor to go and get uh, medical information doctor to doctor. Next slide. Um, I'm going to, uh, one back please. So be sure that your doctor is aware of the 2015 publication um, th that uh, describes evidence-based clinical diagnostic criteria for MECFS. There are many different clinical criteria and they're all uh, useful and helpful, but this one is, uh, was uh, done by the Institute of Medicine, a very respected in institution in our academic centers in the US. Uh, and all you have to do is give your doctor that link uh, down below and let them read for themselves uh, up-to-date knowledge on the science of MECFS. And um, that will help educate them about your illness and help you as you're moving uh, forward in your journey with the illness.
it's important that you learn how to communicate clearly about your illness. And this is, this is not easy. It's very difficult to describe how you feel with ME-CFS. It's difficult to describe what makes it hard for you to, um, to do more and to use your cognition. Um, and it's, it's, uh, it's good practice for you to communicate with your doctors because you're also gonna meet, need to do that with the social security um, institution. You'll have to it, get the language to um, communicate how you can appear almost normal and your ability to do something can appear almost normal uh, when you're rested, um, but is not sustainable day after day due to the development of post-exertional malaise. Um, you've really got to help your doctor know that if you make it to a doctor's appointment, that's your good day. Um, and really need to help them understand how um, that you don't have sustainable energy to be able to maintain full-time work. And also to describe using examples uh, what the daily demands of a work environment uh, do to you, why they're not tolerable without illness worsening and absences. You need to be able to clearly describe why you can't work five days a week, eight hours a day, even at a sedentary job. And it's important to give very specific examples of, of you doing an activity and then developing consequences from doing that activity. You should write down your observations and give it to medical providers and keep your own record, keep a clear and organized record of all the tests, consultations, timeline of events. Um, and if you, you have to learn how to talk to doctors. Um, they don't wanna be bossed around. Um, so you gotta have that, that skill and that nuance of being able to communicate with your doctors, but also um, help them feel respected and in charge of your medical care. But that doesn't mean that you can't bring them uh, things to, to help put in their file or in your record. And you can't tell them what to do, uh, but you can certainly give them um, things to help make it easier for them to document. And don't overwhelm them. Um, then try not to ask a lot of your doctors outside of the office visit because that's what gets very, very difficult. So try to be very efficient during your visits and communicative. You want to be specific about your symptoms in terms of frequency and severity. So instead of saying I'm tired all the time, you really need to describe your level of fatigue as it progresses through the day, what it feels like when you wake up, how long you can do things, when it peaks, what makes it improve or worsen, and how it impacts your ability to function. And you need to do that with all of your symptoms, with pain, with sleep disturbances, um, with brain fog. And it's really important not to overstate um, to get people to believe you. Uh, try not to exaggerate or just, most people aren't exaggerating, you're just trying to make a point. And it's easy to focus only on your worst symptoms um, but people will understand you better if you can give them the ebb and flow of your symptoms uh, and be very concrete. I would also point out physical findings for your provider to assess and record. If you have pale or splotchy skin or uh, a red throat or tender lymph nodes or your imbalance or tremor or thinning hair or muscle or joint tenderness, uh, tender points, um, Bring them to your provider's attention, let them make their own conclusion, and uh, remind them to include them in the notes so that um, it is building a good medical record for you. It's, it's, it's a little bit of a nuance. You've got to do it without making them think you're bossing them around, but you can do that. Okay, now this is a tool we use in our office to collect more specific information, and it tells me a, a huge amount about my patient when they fill this out. So first, I have them estimate the number of good days and the number of bad days per month. And the, the writing here, the red, is the real answers from one of my patients. I just took it right out of her chart. So she estimated she had five to 10 days that were you know, her better days and 20 to 25 days that were her really down days. That says a lot right there. The next thing I have people do is 
is try to estimate their average hours of upright activity. In my office, we call that HUA. That's hours of upright activity. And this is the number of hours your feet are on the floor. So that includes sitting with feet on the floor. Um, feet on the, sitting at a desk with your feet on the floor, standing or walking, as opposed to uh, being in a recliner or in the bed or having your feet tucked up under you. And her estimate uh, on a good day was two to three hours uh, of tw within 24 hours of upright activity. And that is not unusual. Um, that's shocking to most doctors if they could see that. And on a bad day, um, she can do less than an hour um, uh, in the semi-upright or upright position without uh, developing symptoms. And um, you, you can, uh, Again, this is, a, this is pretty um, amazing, um, and this is a good way to communicate uh, to your clinicians um, that, the amount, the way that this illness um, impacts your activity. And it might be that you can do six hours of activity three months, three days in the month. Um, but so this gives uh, your clinician a spread to help them understand uh, the ups and downs of this illness and how it dramatically uh, impairs your ability to have normal activity. Now, this is really just talking about upright activity. It doesn't include um, what happens with cognition and other things, but I think this is one good way to communicate to your clinician, but also keep records of this to be able to provide to Social Security as well. The next thing that I ask patients to do is give very specific examples of what they can do on a good day, and what they cannot do even on a good day. So this patient can, on a good day, go on a drive, go on a short walk, stretch, run an errand, but she can never clean, even on a good day, clean, uh, prepare her own meals or go to work. And then the same thing for a bad day, specific examples of activities and tasks you can still do on a bad day and tasks that you cannot do when you're having a bad day. This paints an immediate picture for your clinician uh, of your level of impairment, and it's a good way to communicate. You can make up your own little form, and you can fill it out multiple times if it's helpful. Um, you can also use it as a starting point uh, to mark your improvement um, when you're trying treatments and, and doing, uh, making uh, progress toward getting better, if, if you're lucky enough to have that happen. All right, next slide. I would, um, I've had, um, there, are, there are many ways to collect objective data that don't just fall under the diagnosis of ME-CFS. So if you have what we consider comorbid conditions or conditions that are probably part of your ME-CFS or close related or have grown out of it, uh, or uh, like uh, POTS, or mast cell, activ <coughs> mast cell activation, or if you have a proven small fiber neuropathy, if you have tests that support an autoimmune condition, if you've had tests to show you have a primary sleep disorder, these are um, comorbid conditions that first of all, you can, you can use to have a, a discussion with your primary care provider and ask them if you've had a workup for these comorbid conditions. Um, but these conditions, if they apply to you, um, build the medical record and also the opportunity to provide objective measures. Um, and I'm, I've, I've listed the major categories and then the objective measure underneath them. So you might have tilt table testing or bedside testing, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, talking about the Nasaline test that are objective and can be included in your record and, and in the application for Social Security disability. So for mast cell, there are blood tests and biopsy specimens that can sometimes support your case. Um, a skin biopsy can uh, help support the diagnosis of small fiber neuropathy um, and, and so on. Next slide. It is, in, it is imperative that you get objective measures into the medical record. Um, these are some examples of useful objective records. Right up at the top is two-day CPET testing, which Dr. Snell is going to talk about. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, the 10-minute Nasaline test, 
which is uh, sort of a, a poor man's version of the tilt table test. So if you can get tilt table testing and it can demonstrate uh, orthostatic intolerance disorders, uh, that again is another, uh, that's listed in social security uh, ruling as a, a meaningful bedside test. And um, neurocognitive testing is a little bit expensive, but if, you, if it can demonstrate the cognitive slowing we know is part of this illness, that can be very uh, powerful. And sometimes the, the cognitive issues are the more primary reason uh, for disability and inability to stay in the workplace. Uh, Nonspecific spots and things on the MRI, abnormal sleep studies, your own self-monitoring, and then any lab abnormalities. So um, make sure that your, your, your central doctors uh, understand that you've had these tests, you keep a record of them, and, um, and, and build this uh, medical record of, of objective evidence supporting your illness. So this is uh, what the, the ME-CFS uh, evidence-based clinical diagnostic criteria that came out of that Institute of Medicine report. And I just want to point out some things. Um, so the core criteria are impaired function, uh, in, in inability to function normally. Um, the second is post-exertional malaise. The third is unrefreshing or disordered sleep. And then you have to have either cognitive impairment or orthostatic intolerance. These are the core symptoms to diagnose ME-CFS. They must be moderate to severe and present more than 50% of the time. And then there are a lot of other symptoms uh, that we know occur in people, pain and immune manifestations and um, many others. But what I wanna point out about the core features is we have objective measures for four of those three things. Um, and actually, the number one, impaired fit function and post-exertional malaise are really the flip side of the same thing, and that is very low energy reserves. So this is what's demonstrated so well with CPET testing, is a very solid science behind the fact that uh, you have Im impaired function, low energy reserves, and if you exceed them, your illness worsens and creates more symptoms, which we call post-exertional malaise. Um, we have many ways of studying sleep, uh, polysomnography, home monitoring, uh, home sleep studies. I talked about getting cognitive testing, and now um, I want to talk a little bit about orthostatic intolerance syndromes and how documenting those can also add uh, to the medical record. So let me define orthostatic intolerance first. Um, it's simply the development of symptoms while standing upright that are relieved by reclining. It doesn't say what the disorder is. It's just that's the orthostatic intolerance describes an, a, 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 something that happens to you. And if you have this, if you have orthostatic intolerance, that meaning you can't stand in place very long, you don't tolerate standing in the shower, um, at any time that you have to stand in one place, you become more and more ill and that's relieved by lying down. A large number, maybe the majority of people with ME-CFS experience some kind of orthostatic intolerance. So the way we measure orthostatic intolerance, the gold standard has always been thought as a tilt table test, but honestly, it's hard to get one. And there are many ways people interpret it. There are, there's not a, a standardized way of doing it in our disorder. So if you can get a, an, a tilt table test that's abnormal, that's a very strong piece of objective evidence, but may not be available uh, widely. Some doctors just do bedside orthostatics uh, measurements, measuring your blood pressure and heart rate, first sitting and then standing for like one or three minutes. That will not elicit the kind of findings that we need. Um, you can also track your own heart rate and report that to your doctor, both as a level of exertion, but also um, maybe to help support the idea that you have a that you have postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. That would be your heart rate is low when you're lying down, and it, it goes very high when you're standing um, when you're standing up. But let me talk about the 10-minute Nasoline test that we've been studying at the Bateman Horn Center. Just for visual, this. Uh, is the position you're in when you're standing up. You, all, you need very little equipment, um, just a blood pressure cuff and some way to monitor your pulse. Um, 
but the test starts and then you you um the only part touching the wall is the back of your shoulders and this is to help stabilize your leg muscles and you so you're not dizzy and also so you're not clenching the muscles in your legs for during the measurements next slide So these are syndromes of orthostatic intolerance. Um, there are many other causes of orthostatic intolerance, but these are labels that doctors understand. Um, they know what orthostatic hypotension is. They know what postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome is. There are published definitions. So you, if, and also neurally mediated hypotension, which is a fainting, a delayed faint during these tests. Um, and these are, these are diagnoses that can help support your, um, your application. That it is written, it, we know that, that orthostatic intolerance syndromes are part of the core uh, diagnostic criteria. So, um, and there are actually studies, maybe not widely available to doctors yet, that show that in MECFS, orthostatic intolerance can be present and diminish blood flow to the brain, even if you don't get a rapid heart rate response or drop your blood pressure. So hopefully with time, uh, these studies will become more evident. Next slide. So I'm just gonna quickly show you an example of a 10 minute lean test in one of my patients. So the test is carried out by lying down quietly on the bed until your whole uh, autonomic system equilibrates and you're resting. So I usually have people be in a dark room, do some, do some relaxation breathing, and after about 10 or 15 minutes, take a blood pressure and a heart rate. And you can see this woman's blood pressure uh, in yellow was 112 over 78, and her pulse or her heart rate was 75 beats per minute. After obtaining these supine measurements or lying down, we had the patient stand up against the wall like you saw in the picture on the last slide. And if you just look down the numbers at what happened to her blood pressure, first it went up because there was a, 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 a shot of adrenaline and her adrenergic system trying to keep her from fainting. Um, but then you see a very disturbing trend in the blood pressure. It goes up and then it can't be sustained. And in the 10th minute, if we hadn't, stop the test, she would have fainted. And if you look in parallel to her pulse, it started out resting at 75. And by the time, and it went higher and higher and higher, trying to keep her from fainting. This is a response to your stress response and the sympathetic nervous system. Um, so she met criteria for what we call neurally mediated hypotension, even within 10 minutes. Usually takes up a 30 minute test to show this. Next slide. Um, this is another patient. Um, this was on her treatments um, for POTS. You can see lying down, relaxed, rested, her, the yellow 130 over 86 blood pressure and a nice low heart rate of 52. And by the fifth minute um, of standing, we had to stop the test because she was going to pass out. And you can see she, uh, her heart rate uh, more than doubled uh, to 109. And unfortunately, she didn't, couldn't sustain her blood pressure either. So she met criteria for orthostatic hypotension and POTS. Next slide. I want to tell you something hopeful, and that is there is a special themed issue on MECFS of a journal called WORK, a journal of prevention, assessment, and rehabilitation. And I wanna give you a little heads up, there will be a very excellent paper uh, in that publication when it comes out called Documenting Disability in Myalgic Encephalomyelitis Chronic Fatigue Syndrome. This is going to be a very comprehensive instruction on all the things you need to do to prepare uh, and be successful in your disability application. Next slide. I've also put some uh, additional resources here. Uh, the first one is um, a paper already available by the same authors about medically documenting disability in MECFS uh, directed at the pediatric cases, so young people and uh, adolescents and, and young people. And that's also a very good document that you can access at that, um, at that link. There 
is a whole section in the IOM report it's, that I showed you the reference to to give your physicians. And that it's called Appendix C, and it's information on disability and MECFS. Um, mostly helpful probably for the direction for your medical provider, but anyone of course can access it. The Centers for Disease website has a section on disability and MECFS. And there's also, um, but there's actually information that I'm sure we'll hear about later about uh, through the Social Security Administration about uh, how to um, how to go about things when you have uh, uh, MECFS. So how do you provide that medical evidence? How do you gather that objective data? And then the last slide was just that um, we'll try to make available to you links to um, that inst instructions for doing the 10 minute Nasalin test and also that US Clinician Coalition document uh, diagnosing and treating MECFS. Thank you very much. And um, this is a very difficult process. So you just have to be patient uh, and work through it. Thank you very much, Dr. Bateman. That was terrific. And for those, a couple of you have joined since the last, this is Sharon. I'm, I'm disembodied at this moment. I can pop on my webcam also. Um, uh, wanted to mention there'll be questions at the end because I know some of you have joined since uh, we first came on and we have a whole lot of questions that were uh, provided by people when they registered. And uh, next up will be Dr. Schnell talking about what to do when you're denied and some ob objective um, measurements. And I will go offline and disappear while he talks. I, well, thank you. Um, and thank you, Dr. Bateman. Uh, welcome to yet another presentation about illness and disease. Um, after, uh, I hope everybody's surviving in these difficult times. Uh, after a, a month of sheltering in place, I'm starting to appreciate a little more uh, of how it feels to, to have MECFS. I'm going to talk to you today about uh, cardiopulmonary exercise testing. Uh, for those of you who are not aware, uh, we developed a two-day exercise test approximately 15 years ago, specifically for the purposes of trying to assess post-exertional malaise in uh, MECFS. Uh, our background is in the sports and exercise sciences. Um, and uh, cardiopulmonary exercise testing has been around for a long time in that area. Uh, it's encroached into the medical area with regard to primarily cardiovascular disease. Um, it's a fairly routine test. It, it's not easy to accomplish. Uh, it, 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 is, it is quite technical, but, but it's been around for a long, long time. So the, the tenets of CPET testing are, are well established. The, the addition of the second test duplicates exactly the process of the initial test 24 hours later uh, with a, a perspective for looking for changes in function that would be indicative of uh, some sort of pathology. So we, we gather a number of objective measures uh, and they're primarily centered on uh, oxygen use in the body. Oxygen is the key factor in producing energy. And we look at primarily three key measures. So we measure peak oxygen consumption, which is a measure of your ultimate capacity to do things, to do work, to exercise. Uh, we look at oxygen consumption at the ventilatory anaerobic threshold, uh, that's a well-established sub-maximal measure, and it's the point at which uh, any activity is going to be limited. Uh, once you exceed that anaerobic threshold, uh, it looks like somebody that's ran out of uh, gas. Uh, you, you'll see athletes doubled over, sucking in huge lungfuls of air, trying to replenish that oxygen. Once you exceed that area, you, you're not going to be working for too much longer. 
Another key measure that people may not be aware about is, is something called a respiratory exchange ratio. And that's essentially the ratio between the amount of carbon dioxide produced in metabolism and the amount of oxygen used. Not only does it tell us how metabolism is working in the energy substrates that are being utilized, it's also the most valid and reliable measure of effort. And that's why it's key for any test that, that is going to be uh, attempting to establish impairment or disability. Essentially, it cannot be cheated. It's uh, a process that you can't control. It's an involuntary process. So therefore, if we get our, our required numbers on the test, we can rule out malingering completely. So nobody can turn around and say, well, this person is just not trying hard enough. And, and so but by applying these uh, measures, uh, could you just go back one slide, please? Thank you. By applying these measures, we, we can many measure fatigue regardless of source. So it really doesn't matter what, what the, the source of the fatigue is. And, and when I do the reports, I actually prefer to write them without knowing what a person's diagnosis is. I have been accused in the past of being an advocate for uh, MECFS, and I don't deny that. But, but it, it does help me. Uh, it does help my credibility if I can uh, interpret the test independent of diagnosis. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, all of the data that we collect during CPET is, is objective in nature. Uh, and so therefore, it, it's not really a questionable about, oh, well, this is a lifestyle choice. This is the person making this decision to, to, to do that. So it's objective and reliable. Based upon that information, I, I will uh, draw a conclusion. Uh, and it, it can indicate uh, a restriction on capacity for full-time employment. Uh, what that means is that, that there should be some accommodations in the workplace, or it could preclude employment at even a sedentary or stationary nature. Uh, what we do when we conduct the test prior to writing a report, we would give you an indication if the results are not going to be favorable to uh, uh, establishing impairment. And then it's the person's choice about whether they have the report written or not. If the report isn't written, then it can't enter the medical record. OK, next slide, please. Um, Very often, as most of you are probably aware, that uh, insurance companies and, and other entities don't like to pay out. Uh, and so very often, people will question the CPEP report. So it may get sent to an independent medical reviewer who may or may not be independent. And they will read the report, uh, whether they're qualified to interpret it or not. And very often, they will ask me questions. Uh, the, the routine is that they try and call you on the phone. Uh, we, we no longer answer questions over the phone. If they have questions, they need to provide them in writing. Uh, if they provide them in, in writing, then whatever answers we provide will go into the record and they cannot be edited in the, the person's report. So, uh, Many of the arguments that, that people put up are that uh, these results are explained by obesity. Uh, they may be inconsistent with uh, EKG. Uh, the patient was malingering. Uh, physician was not on site to supervise the results. Uh, the, these uh, issues can be very easily countered. I've already addressed the malingering question. Uh, we do run EKG during the test. Uh, so we will have uh, an EKG that can be interpreted by a cardiologist. Uh, 
Uh, very often, our, uh, usually our patients don't have cardiovascular disease. Uh, it, it's not it's not routinely found in MECFS. Uh, on, on occasion, we have had people that have had a, an abnormal EKG and, and it turned out they did have cardiovascular disease that was undiagnosed. Uh, so one point here just to be aware of that just because you have a diagnosis of MECFS, it doesn't mean that you are, uh, can't uh, get other conditions and very often any other symptoms are, if somebody's had a CFS diagnosis, any other symptoms that appear will be put down to that diagnosis, even if they're attributable to another condition. Uh, next slide, please. Um, a major focus of, the, of this uh, round table today is the Social Security Administration and the Associate Social Security Administration has a number of uh, entries in their publications that, that are actually helpful uh, when it comes to, to looking at, at CPET. So that a key feature for the Social Security Administration is objective medical evidence. Uh, CPET can provide irrefutable objective medical evidence. Uh, next. Uh, it's actually a requirement for Social Security that, that a disabling impairment is documented with acceptable clinical and laboratory findings. So that they, they uh, say it's essential to submit all objective findings available. Uh, one interesting feature of the Social Security Administration publications is that uh, they don't have specific uh, objective criteria for diseases per se. So if a severely medically determinable impairment that does not meet a listing, uh, then they will match it up with another medical listing. So if it's somewhere in there that your impairment matches an impairment, even if it's not the disease that you're diagnosed with, that then that is a legitimate objective finding. Next slide, please. Uh, the SSA do have a publication on uh, MECFS and it states an abnormal exercise stress test is among laboratory findings that establish the existence of a medically determinable impairment in people with CFS. So it's there in black and white. They will accept an abnormal exercise stress test as objective evidence of laboratory findings. Uh, interestingly, in the cardiovascular section, they do refer specifically to CPET with gas exchange. So they do accept exercise tolerant tests, exercise tolerance tests as a, a measure of impairment in cardiovascular disease. And they do have a specific statement that uh, those an exercise tolerance test with measured gas exchange is a more accurate measurement of aerobic capacity than without. So that's a specific reference to CPET with gas exchange or the protocols that, that we employ. Uh, next slide, please. Um, very often we, we have to deal with um, insurance companies or the Social Security Administration uh, beyond the CPET test. The CPET test itself uh, is limited purely to objective evidence. It does not contain anything about a diagnosis. It will not have any other information in from your medical record. As I indicate, indicated previously, I prefer to write those without knowing what the diagnosis is. But I may be required or we may be required to respond to a, a negative review of the CPET test. Uh, that that opens uh, up uh, the possibility for, for me to, to editorialize a little bit and to, to provide further information. So, so this can be very useful. So very often they will question the accuracy of the patient's self-reported symptoms. One of the things that we include in our CPET test is a post-exercise questionnaire. 
So we, we ask you what happened to you in the seven days following the exercise test. Invariably in people that meet a diagnosis of ME-CFS, we will see the usual symptoms of post-exertional delays. Uh, because this has been raised now by the uh, insurers, then we can start to delve into that a little further. So by questioning the veracity, morality, and accuracy of patients' self-reported symptoms, uh, that, that allows for us to take this a little bit further. Uh, very often there are aspects of the CPET test, objective measures that match up with symptoms from the person's medical record. What that is, that's an objective measure that uh, will support a self-reported symptom. The more of those instances that we can get, the, the better. Um, if somebody is going to have an objective indicator for seven of their PEM symptoms, then the likelihood that they're making the eighth one up is, is extremely unlikely. That there are, there's a quite a lot of backing for the use of uh, self-report symptoms. For many years, it was the mainstay of medicine, the, the, uh, the medical or the clinical interview. Uh, the IOM uh, in the MECFS report that, that has already been talked about, uh, they specifically say that it's paramount in diagnosing to take a careful patient history. Interestingly, the IOM have also produced a report on uh, diagnostic criteria across the medical field. And they pointed out some of the problems of physicians who don't acknowledge patient self-report symptoms. Uh, and very often that, that can lead to uh, a diagnostic error and danger to the patient. Uh, their publication all includes instances where people have died because the physician did not listen to the patient when they were telling them about their symptoms. Uh, the other thing that it allows us to do, it, it allows us then to draw on our experience with MECFS. And we have a long history of dealing with MECFS. We've tested a lot of patients that have a diagnosis of MECFS. So once again, we can bring that up in the uh, rebuttal letter. And uh, start to substantiate post-exertional malaise. Uh, very often with the two-day test, we also get a performance dec decrement on the second day. Uh, we're not the only ones to have found this. Uh, the IOM drew attention to it in the report as an objective measure of delayed recovery in patients with ME-CFS. Since the uh, IOM report has been published, there have been more studies come out that substantiate these findings. So it's starting to become a well-established finding with MECFS and can be extremely helpful in uh, cases of impairment and disability. Uh, next slide, please. Um, another, uh, issue that's often brought up is, is the issue of psychiatric problems. And well, this person's just depressed, and that explains all of their symptoms. Uh, depression does not explain CPET results. There's no evidence to suggest that it does. Uh, the IOM, once again, have been very, very helpful, uh, and, and they, they generally dismiss uh, psychiatric disorders as explaining MECFS symptoms. This was actually a major step forward. Uh, in the days of exclusionary diagnosis, psychiatric disorders could be used to exclude an MECFS diagnosis. Uh, the IOM have, have repudiated that. And fortunately, since the IOM report came out, the CDC have adopted most of their recommendations and the updated CDC website is almost a mirror image of the IOM report, which is extremely useful. 
Uh, we can also cite uh, research where uh, depression and exercise and MECFS and exercise uh, do not produce the same results in terms of uh, CPET testing. Uh, next slide, please. Deconditioning, this, this is another favorite. Um, once again, uh, deconditioning is, is not a, a trivial symptom. Uh, it's common in many diseases and particularly diseases which limit a person's uh, level of activity. So it's helpful to point out that deconditioning is often associated with chronic illness uh, and it, it, it needs to be examined in detail. Uh, what we do, if we, we will deal with that with the CPET results. One of the advantages of CPET results, it can be used for differential diagnosis. So although I've said that we don't diagnose, what we can illustrate is that the CPET, the objective CPET results do not match up with results that are seen purely with deconditioning. So once again, this is a very helpful counter to the, the deconditioning argument, even though there may be some element of deconditioning contributing to a per person's uh, results. Uh, generally, many of the patients, or to be honest, most of the patients we see, uh, their level of function is, it is at a level below what you would see with deconditioning. A vast majority of the United States population are actually deconditioned. Uh, when you compare uh, population data with the data that we get from CPET, uh, you, you will see uh, clear distinct dif differences. Next slide, please. Hey, Chris, it's Sharon. Uh, we're, we're kind of running over a little bit on, on time, and I want to make sure we have you know, plenty of time for question and answers and for um, Dr. Uh, Ms. Leland to give her presentation. So okay. you have a last couple of words you'd like to say before we move to the next presentation? Um, okay, just, just flip through a couple of slides. Just let me see where we are. Okay, I was just going to finish up with, with this one thing because it, it, it is a little bit of uh, light at the end of the tunnel. So uh, with a lot of time on our hands, we can't do testing at the moment. It, it's it's occasion just to think about where does CFIT fit in with, uh, with the, the coronavirus. And the, there is a, a precedent here that CPET has been used uh, quite extensively post SARS and it has established functional deficits in, in persons with uh, recovering from SARS. Uh, we know that there's gonna be a huge population of people that are gonna be researched uh, following uh, th this recent academ academic uh, epidemic. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, uh, and our expectation is that uh, there's a strong likelihood that when we start to look at uh, the, the post-viral fatigue in those patients, it may shed some light on some of the post-viral fatigue mechanisms uh, attributable in uh, MECFS. Thank you very much. That's great. Thank you. Um, and you'll, we'll hear from Dr. Schnell again when, during the question and answers, but at this moment, we're going to switch uh, gears slightly and talk about legal barriers and challenges uh, to applying and receiving uh, social security disability. Uh, Ms. Leland, it's all yours. Hi, thank you so much for the introduction. I will be discussing primarily social security disability programs, uh, but I will touch on long-term disability. But if you have any questions about long-term disability, uh, you can ask those during the office hours. So first, let me start out by saying there are two programs uh, that the federal government provides for individuals with disabilities. One is called Social Security Disability Insurance, which we often hear 
called as SSDI or Title II. The other program is Supplemental Security Income, which most people call SSI. So these two programs are different, but they have one thing in common, which is the medical criteria used to uh, determine if someone qualifies uh, are the same. The difference is, uh, and I'll start with SSDI. SSDI pays benefits if you are what they consider insured, meaning you have to have enough credit. So usually that is if you worked five of the past 10 years before your disability started, you will have enough credits to be insured under that program. Benefits for SSDI are not paid right away. There's a five month waiting period. Uh, they are paid six months after your disability has begun or one year prior to the date of your application, whichever is later. So for example, if you waited two, three years to apply after you stopped working, the most that they will go back to pay you is one year before your application date. With SSDI, you would get Medicare, but the Medicare doesn't start right away. It starts two years after Social Security finds that you became disabled. One thing about Social Security Disability or SSDI is that your dependents, your children, your spouse can qualify for benefits and these are called auxiliary benefits. Uh, and if anyone has questions later, I'll go into more detail, but for example, children 18 years and under who are full-time students and unmarried uh, would get benefits under your uh, count. Um, another interesting thing is that if your earnings were not real high, you may be able to get benefits for being disabled under a spouse's account. When you apply for Social Security, uh, the Social Security uh, office will ask you these questions. So then what is the difference with SSI? SSI is a welfare-based program and it has resource and income limits. Currently, uh, the limits are that an individual cannot have more than $783 in income per month to qualify and no more than $2,000 in uh, bank accounts, savings, investments, etc. So it's quite low. A couple can have no more than $1,175 in income per month to qualify and no more than $3,000 in resources. SSI does not have the same waiting period and benefits are paid the month after you apply if you are approved. SSI comes with Medi-Cal or Medicaid entitlement a month after your application if you're approved. And generally, SSI is only available to US citizens, whereas SSDI is available to legal residents. Also, SSI does not pay benefits for dependents. Next slide, please. Uh, oh, actually, I'll just briefly mention uh, if you are owed benefits, because this can take a long time to get approved, uh, you will be entitled to back pay. SSDI will just pay that to you in one lump sum. SSI, unfortunately, will make that in three payments, three installments. So what is the time frame? That's what I'm asked a lot. The initial application, anywhere from three to six months to get a decision on your case. Unfortunately, a lot of people are denied at this level. I would say over 50%, uh, especially with a condition like a chronic fatigue syndrome, which is not a specific listed impairment that Social Security has, and also it's a little harder to prove. Uh, so if you have to appeal, you ask for reconsideration of your claim. And this again takes anywhere from three to six months for a decision. If that is denied, you have to ask for a hearing before an administrative law judge. The wait times for hearings are currently 18 to 22 months. If you are denied at the administrative law judge level, you must appeal to what's called the Appeals Council, and this can take 12 to 18 months for them to respond. If denied by the Appeals Council, you then are able to file in federal court. And at this point, you can also do a new application while you're waiting for a decision on your first application. Of course, if you're denied in district court, you may file in the Court of Appeals. Um, I would say that uh, most of our clients uh, with chronic fatigue syndrome are approved 
uh, at least by the judge level, the administrative level, uh, although some we do have to go to appeals council and federal court since it is a more difficult condition to prove and get approved. Uh, next slide, please. So the definition of disability it, for social security purposes is the inability to engage in substantial gainful activity due to physical or mental impairments that are expected to either result in death or last for at least 12 full months. So this is important. If you just stopped working a month ago, Social Security is going to look to see if your condition will be disabling, keep you from working for another 11 months or more in order to qualify. So as Dr. Snell outlined, you must show that your condition meets one of Social Security's listed impairments or that you're unable to do your past work and cannot adjust to other work. And they will look at factors such as your age, your education, and your medical condition. Okay, and what is substantial gainful activity? Currently in, in 2020, uh, work that is earns you $1,260 a month or more is considered substantial gainful activity for Social Security, and that's more if you are considered blind. Substantial meaning that you have to exert a significant mental amount of mental or physical activity, gainful, generally paid work. However, keep in mind, if you are doing activities that are generally paid, but you're not getting paid, Social Security will still say you are working and that will disqualify you from getting benefits. So, for example, if you're working for a family member, let's say uh, answering telephones and you're doing it for free, that would still be considered work. Next slide. Okay, so I'll briefly go over uh, Social Security's evaluation process. There is a five-step evaluation process. The first step is, are you working? And I apologize, there's a typographical error on my slide. Um, if you are earning $1,260 a month or more, you're generally considered to be working and disqualified. If you're not, then you will go on to step two. And again, uh, there are different rules if you are working for yourself, uh, because perhaps you'll show no income even though you really are working. Uh, next slide. So the next step is, do you have a severe impairment? Now, this is a very uh, low threshold to meet. Anything more than a minimal impairment will be considered severe. Uh, so anything that is affecting your ability to lift, carry, walk, concentrate, anything of that sort will be considered severe. So you would then go on to the next step, uh, step three. Next slide. So step three, as Dr. Snell also discussed, is do you meet one of Social Security's listed impairments or do you equal one of those impairments? Um, so Social Security has their list of medical conditions that will qualify you if you meet their criteria specifically. That's usually very hard. Um, now, if not, they'll look to see if you equal uh, a listed condition. Is it equal in severity and duration to one of their conditions? Now, although there is no specific listing for chronic fatigue syndrome, there are other impairments that people with chronic fatigue syndrome uh, may have, and those things may uh, have to be a listed impairment. For example, if you're having neurocognitive issues, memory problems, there are listings for, for neurocognitive problems. Um, so if you meet or equal one of those listings, you're found disabled, we stop there. If not, Social Security will determine what is your residual functional capacity? What are you still able to do? Uh, so the most you can do despite your medical limitations. So this is very important when you go to the doctor to talk about these things. You might not always think to talk about, you know, how your condition is affecting you. Make sure as um, Dr. Snell and Dr. Bateman pointed out, very important to tell your doctor, uh, you know, keep a journal, for example, um, you know, how many good days and bad days you're having, uh, how much you can lift and carry, how often you're lying down, things like that. Um, you know, any anything that's going on, fatigue, uh, and so forth. Next slide. 
So uh, going on to step four is they're going to look to see if you can do your past work. Um, now, this is a little tricky. If you were working for an employer and your employer was giving you accommodations, you may be denied at this step. For example, if your employer was letting you take as many unscheduled breaks as you wanted during the day to lie down, if your employer was uh, letting you work from home, things like that, if you could still do your work with those accommodations, you will be denied at this step. Um, but if not, the uh, Social Security Administration or the judge is going to look at what your functional capacity is compared to your past work. If you cannot do your past work, and that's work that was done in the last 15 years, then you go on to the next step. Next slide. So step five, if you can't do your other work, can you do other work in the national economy? And this is work that might not be local uh, because this is a national program. So they're going to look at the entire United States and see if there are some jobs that you can do given your age, your education, your past work experience, and what you're still able to do, your capacity. Next slide. One thing that people frequently ask me is, uh, what if I try to work and I'm not able to? Will that uh, disqualify me from getting benefits? Well, the answer is not necessarily. So if you try to work and that work stops before six full months uh, because of your impairment, then that work effort can be called an unsuccessful work attempt and it will not disqualify you from getting benefits. And if people have further questions about that, we can talk about that later. Next slide. So, um, and actually let's, let's skip this slide for right now. Next slide. Uh, again, as Dr. Snell mentioned, uh, Social Security does not have a particular listed impairment for uh, chronic fatigue syndrome, but there is a ruling that tells Social Security how they are supposed to evaluate chronic fatigue syndrome. And I won't go into this in great detail since uh, the doctors Bateman and Snell did go over this, but it is, so, it is so important for your doctors to document the signs, laboratory findings, as well as your subjective symptoms in the medical records. So make sure you get a copy of your records, make sure that these things are there. Um, so under Social Security, uh, you cannot be found disabled based only on your reported symptoms. And that's different from what uh, in the medical community is needed to generally to find that you have the condition. But for Social Security, you must also have some objective findings documented in addition to reported symptoms. Next slide. So Social Security is going to look at how often you go to the doctor, what medications and treatments you've tried, your compliance with those, and your daily activities. So as I said, very important that this is documented in your treatment records. I also recommend patients keep a journal. Uh, Dr. Bateman had an excellent slide on that. Keep track of your good and bad days, how often you're taking naps. Uh, what, what you feel like when you do engage in activities, if you have crashes, how many days a month this is. Uh, Social Security is also going to look at evidence from parents, siblings, spouses, so you can also submit statements from them. They'll have forms for them to complete. You can also submit a statement from a past employer, a rehabilitation counselor, and teachers. Um, it's also really useful to get what we call medical source statements or have your doctors either complete a questionnaire regarding your chronic fatigue syndrome and other, uh, other conditions, or to uh, give an opinion in a paragraph form about what your specific limitations are. Next slide. I'll quickly go through uh, private disability insurance. This is not my area of expertise, but short-term disability and long-term disability are private. Uh, programs that some people may have through work, for example, or if you purchased it yourself. Um, so it's not based on the taxes that you've paid to the federal government. Short-term disability usually pays for six months, but it can pay for up to two years. 
long-term disability can pay up to your retirement age, which is usually 65, although for Social Security, it's actually 66 and a half. Uh, both LTD and STD pay more than Social Security often. It can pay up to 60% of your salary. But just keep in mind, if you get LTD and, S and Social Security, SSDI, you're not gonna get both. The LTD will be reduced generally by Social Security disability benefits. And LTD may or may not be taxed. Uh, the definition for disability uh, for LTD policies is a little different. Usually for the first two years, you can be found disabled if you cannot do your own occupation. After two years, it usually means you usually must show you can't do any occupation, which is similar to the Social Security standard. Next slide. So um, as, as we said, SSDI and SSI are funded by your taxes and the Social Security Administration, LTD, STD are funded by the insurance companies or an employer. Um, and we've already discussed most of, of these uh, bullet points on this slide. Um, so we'll go to the next slide. Um, I do like to point out Social Security does not have the limitations that many long-term disability policies have. Um, for example, LTD may say that you don't qualify because you have a pre-existing condition that was limited in your policy. Some LTD policies state that after two years, if you are approved because of chronic fatigue syndrome, you may no longer qualify. Um, this is not the case with Social Security, although Social Security will continually review to make sure you still are disabled, they do not cut you off of the benefits uh, based on the kind of disability. And keep in mind that the evidence you get for one case can be used for the other case. And important also is that the CPET testing can be quite costly, and if you do have an LTD case, LTD attorneys are often able to uh, front those costs. Next slide. So as I believe Dr. Bateman went into great detail about uh, building your case, it's very important to keep track, keep a journal, keep track of your good and bad days, uh, ask your doctor to complete a form or um, you know, write a, a paragraph, really outlining all the objective findings, clinical findings, the symptoms that you have, and your actual limitations, that's critical. You can also get statements from employers, coworkers, friends, families, et cetera. Next slide. As I think Dr. Bateman also mentioned, it is so important to establish a good relationship with your doctor. If you don't feel like your doctor listens to you, you don't feel like your doctor is believing you, which has happened to my clients, switch doctors. Okay, um, make sure that you have a good relationship. And again, get your records to make sure that it's documenting everything. Next slide. Uh, oh, and I should mention, Social Security is going to give the most weight to an MD, DO, PhD, or PsyD. However, they are now accepting uh, opinions from nurse practitioners and physician's assistants. One thing to keep in mind is that when you fill out questionnaires for Social Security, which they will send you, such as function reports, disability reports, think about how you feel on a bad day. This is not somewhere where you're trying to apply for a job. Don't sound better than you really are. Make sure Social Security knows when you get help from friends or family to make meals, do chores around the house, taking care of kids or pets, make sure that you indicate that you get help. Uh, next slide. Okay, I'm sorry, I thought there was one other slide, I apologize. Um, one last thing that I'll say is that um, I often tell people, if you have a clear cut case, no need to hire an attorney at the get-go. Uh, you can apply online, by phone, or in person, uh, of course not now with the coronavirus, but usually in person. Uh, if it's SSI only though, you would have to apply uh, by phone or in person. Um, chronic fatigue syndrome cases can be uh, much more 
difficult to get approved at the first level. So don't give up, keep going, keep trying. And at that point, you would probably want to hire an attorney if you're denied initially. So thank you. And if you have questions, uh, we'll all be here to answer. Thank you. That was terrific. Uh, if everyone else of uh, the panel could reappear, that would be great and reconnect so they can be heard. A couple of things I just wanted to mention. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, this particular seminar will be over at 2.30 East Coast time, 11.30 West Coast time, so in about 15 minutes. Uh, but there will be office hours or time for questions and answers um, that will start at uh, 1 o'clock West Coast time, 4 o'clock East Coast time, and that will be available at www.meadvocacyweek.com. So I'll, I'll repeat that again at the end. Um, so I think there's one of the questions that was, was presented, and I think it's, it's, you know, it kind of gets to the crux of the matter is, what are the common mistakes that you see in people applying for or dealing with trying to get uh, disability coverage? Excellent question. Um, I think for Social Security benefits, one of the biggest uh, mistakes I see is in filling out the forms that Social Security will send you. So even if you do hire an attorney, they will send forms directly to the person applying. Um, they'll send you a function report questionnaire asking what you can do. Um, you know, it's hard to admit that you're having these limitations. So a lot of people will uh, write more than they really can do on an ongoing basis. Uh, because Social Security needs to see how are you day in and day out, five days a week, eight hours a day. So yes, maybe you're able to go grocery shopping, uh, take a walk around you know, with your pet. Uh, but if these are things that you don't do very often, you do maybe once a week, it's critical that you let them know. These are not things you can do every day all of these activities. Um, and I know that it can. some people are extremely embarrassed to have to discuss this, but keep in mind, this is confidential. This is just something you will send to Social Security. Do not puff yourself up. Also, when you're filling out a questionnaire, uh, the work history report, a lot of times people um, say that they are a supervisor, for example. It's really important not to make your job sound um, I guess I should say more important than it was uh, that you had more duties than you really had. Uh, you know, if you were supervising, but you were actually having to do all of the work that the other workers were doing, that needs to be uh, explained. Okay. Doctors Bateman or Snell, the common uh, common errors or common omissions that you may see in in uh, working with people when they're applying. Um, that's really interesting. The most common thing I see is people panicking when they get their first denial. So think about applying to Social Security as dealing with the tax, uh, federal taxes. So I tell patients, just do exactly what they want when they want it, no more, no less, um, and, and just follow the rules. Um, and I, in my experience, uh, I think I would tell people up front that they're going to be denied uh, on the first go round and the second go round. So just expect that you're going to march forward uh, to that uh, the hearing stage with the administrative law judge. Um, and if you know that, you can calm down. And the other thing is, don't react to the the verbiage um, in the paperwork that you get from Social Security because it sounds very personal, but it's just a canned. Uh, language that they send to people. So mm -hmm. um, they'll say, you know, we and your doctor agree that you 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 can work and that you don't have any problems, kind of thing. So just stay calm and move forward on the pathway. And I would encourage everyone to read that SSR 14-1P. You can just put that in Google, and and you can see, you can print it out, and see um, what kind of proof you're going to need to work on with your doctor. Okay. Dr. Schnell, anything to add? I would just add one thing is very, very carefully vet your attorney uh, that, that you True. really that, that they need I, to know what they're doing. They need to be able to present the evidence. They need to understand the arguments uh, and they, they need to turn up. Absolutely. 
Another question, if a person has multiple health ailments like ME-CSF, fibromyalgia, and POTS, how do you decide which one to file for disability? And is there a way to file each condition instead of just one? Good question. For Social Security purposes, you are going to list every impairment that you have, even something that you don't think is disabling on its own, because Social Security is going to look at all of your medical conditions. Uh, and we really don't care for Social Security purposes why you are approved. Um, you know, if you don't want to be approved because, for example, you're suffering from depression, it doesn't matter why they approve you. So we want to get records from uh, medical providers for all of your conditions. Um, the other thing to keep in mind with LTD, it's a little different because, as I mentioned, LTD may have limitations uh, in the policies and you know, each policy is different. So LTD may decide that after two years, if you were approved because of this chronic fatigue syndrome, you're no longer eligible for that insurance benefit. So for LTD, it may be worthwhile if you have other conditions to throw those in as well. You would always throw in all of your conditions actually, uh, so that perhaps you won't have to be limited by that two year limitation. Either the doc of the other doctors have anything to say on that particular topic? No? There's a no. kind of a series of questions that okay. all are sort of similar. One is, I have been told by a lawyer I need a doctor on my side to navigate this process. I'm having trouble finding a doctor in my insurance that even thinks this is real. What can you do when you can't find a specialist who will take those with ME on as a patient and also can't find an ME specialist in the entire US that will take a Medicaid out of network referral from my PCP? Where do I start considering there are no specialists in my area and none in the surrounding areas that accept my insurance? So they're all kind of an access question. How mm -hmm. do I access a knowledgeable person? Dr. Bateman, what, do you, what, what advice do you have for them? Um, I agree with Moselle. I, if you can't, if you, your doctor won't support you, you need to get a different doctor. And um, I, I encourage people to, you know, get a doctor that will help you, even if they don't feel like an MECFS expert. Um, make their job as easy as they can, as, as you can. But if you have a good relationship with your doctor, they will learn about MECFS and exactly. by caring for you. So that's why it's very important to uh, establish with someone who will take the time to listen to you and take care of you. Total, total agreement, Dr. Snell. Anything to add there? Uh, it, it is a huge problem for people is, is actually finding a, a physician that will even see them. Um, you, you do at least, as, as Dr. Bateman has said, you need somebody that's open to learning about the illness. And, uh, and, uh, and a good physician should be open to learning about the illness. Totally agreed. Um, interesting, what is the success rate of applications for SSDI based on an MECSF diagnosis? Is there, that, are those data available? You know, I'll have to look at that. And so perhaps for the office hours, I can have that. I don't, I don't have anything off the top. Um, you know, I, I think Dr. Bateman uh, hit the nail on the head. Uh, generally, these cases are denied at the initial and reconsideration levels and have to go to the administrative law judge. Um, I would think with good evidence, uh, gosh, you know, it really it, it really depends. I would say it's probably 50-50, um, but I'll look at that. It really depends on how severe. I mean, uh, with any condition, uh, just having the diagnosis is not enough. You have to have a, a proof that it's severe enough that it's limiting your ability to work. Um, so it, it's really on a case by case basis. Well, it is a very interesting, it's this sort of classic conundrum. Um, the question is I keep hearing about the importance of documenting symptoms, but with so many daily symptoms, the documentation itself is physically and mentally exhausting and can trigger PEM. Suggestions, just real practical suggestions. Um, I would say that you don't really have to do extensive documentation of symptoms. You just have to learn the right language to communicate your disease more than anything. Um, it's the, the concept that is so hard for doctors to understand is the concept of limited energy capability and post-exertional malaise. 
be they just it's just something that they don't quite understand and sometimes um using uh saying it's like a mitochondrial disease or you know be able to describe it but mostly is uh, finding the language to communicate uh the impairment of function and it's it's challenging it's challenging one of the things that, that we recommend to patients generally is learning to manage your, your energy. And so whenever you do something out of the ordinary, there's going to be a trade-off. So there's going to be something else that you can't do. Uh, and so that it's just a general piece of advice that, you, you know, learn your, your energy limitations. And if you have to do something, find something else to trade off against that to try and limit the possibility of, of post-exertional malaise. And, and, try to find, oh, and, and the, the other thing is that if you have a spouse or a partner, I, I ask them to help. That's what I was going to say. If there's anyone in the house besides the dog who can help out, that's always good. Um, another one. Some of us have have multiple disabilities, but have been told we are out of um, we are out of work too long and no longer have enough work hour credits to even apply, no matter how ill. Is there any, what, what can I do? <laughs> okay, so that's a good question. So um, if you truly are out of work credits, then you won't qualify for SSDI, but you may qualify for SSI. Again, though, there are those resource and income limits. Uh, and if you're married and your spouse is working, then you may be disqualified. But for SSDI, just remember, you don't, it's okay if you've been out of work uh, even 10 years before applying, as long as you have the evidence. Uh, I've had cases where we went back 20 years and we had the evidence, somehow the, the medical records were there, they weren't destroyed. We were able to prove that the disability started within five years after the person stopped working. So that's what's critical. So, so it, it, you know, if, you, if you're thinking you're not going to apply because you, you just don't want to, make sure you keep your medical records uh, so that if you do decide to apply in the future. Okay. Um, any sort of last one minute apiece comments, and then I'll make two minute comments. Dr. Schnell will start with. Oh, okay. sorry. No, no wrap up. Um, don't give up. You, you know, it, it's it, it can be done. I, it's we, we know how much work it is. I, I think all of us will will help as much as we can. Uh, and, and we do appreciate what, what people go through to, to get these things so that. Perfect. Dr. Bateman? Just take care of yourself in this process. Um, sometimes I see my patients unravel when they're and just get so much sicker uh, when they're caught up in, you know, this long and arduous process. So take care of yourself and uh, try to take it a little at a time. Perfect. Ms. Leland? I, I think doctors Bateman and Snell, you know, covered it perfectly. Don't give up. It can be stressful, uh, but, you know, don't take it personally and try to put it to the back of your mind. I always tell clients, your health is what you need to focus on. Uh, you know, this is going to, uh, it's, it's going to, you just have to keep going, but, you know, take care of yourself. So. Well, I know to the to the larger audience, I know we've thrown a lot of information at you. Um, I would remind you that this whole thing has been recorded and you can go back and look at it in big bits or little bits and all the slides are, uh, you are visible on there. There's a whole bunch of website links and resources that we've provided with you. Um, and I was gonna talk about find, you know, finding a doctor that's willing to work with you, but we've already talked about that. But I just kind of want to make the observation as someone kind of adjacent to this area that knowledge is clearly increasing all the time and data sets are being generated and those data sets have power and all of that will enable more successful interactions with these bureaucracies and institutions because the more objective and fact-based we can make this, the more power it has. And we who are involved in this effort want to support all of you out there in your in your efforts and um i guess kind of reminding you that as we all have it's a, it's a we're all in a marathon here actually at the moment in life we're in a marathon with an unknown 
uh, unknown uh, outcome or resolution, but uh, even more so for people that are grappling with um, these conditions. So thank you for your attention. And um, I guess that's it. <laughs> and we do again, thank our sponsor. Thank you. We'll, we'll all wave goodbye to you. And um, that, would, that would wrap up our, uh, our hour and a half with you. So, bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.